earth, fire, air, and water. These four elements were at the heart of the original orbs and later crystals within the Final Fantasy series. And while many things have changed over the years, the importance of those crystals remains at the heart of it. In a similar vein, the concept of a Final Fantasy TRPG had taken many turns, where disagreements with the original team led to offshoots and spin-offs, several of which we've covered in this series. I bring them up because each has been a building block for our final part of FF Week, taking inspiration from the past to build a version that the creator hopes someone will follow suit with in the future. This resulting 4th edition of the Final Fantasy TRPG aims to use the original four elements as its core pillars, taking cues from Returners, Zodiac, Seed, D20, and D6. How does it hold up? Let's find out. In previous instances, the multi-class idea of job and sub-job was an optional endeavor. 4th edition is not the case, and we'll be exploring this with Lun once again. The first step is to choose three traits and three quirks. These determine how one gains experience points as well as how one gains destiny points, the latter of which we'll get to in a bit. We'll go with Mercenary, Reputation, and Monster Hunter for our traits, and Brute, Caustic, and Focused for our quirks. Step two is jobs. Each character has a primary and a secondary job, each with different pools of abilities. Since we're still working with the Dark Knight motif, We'll go with Adept as our main and Berserker as our secondary. This grants us the Martial Discipline and Shadow Strike abilities from being an Adept and the Counter Attack ability. Third is Stats. We start with 200 experience to distribute between the four stats of Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. Now this is not a one-to-one -one formula, as increasing a stat's value is 1 XP plus twice the stat's level, leveling every 10 points. So we'll be spending it as follows. 70 to Earth, 20 to Air, 20 to fire, and 90 to water. This means we have an earth level of 2, air of 1, fire of 1, and water of 3. This also means that we have an HP of 104 and an MP of 30. Fourth is skills. A character gets one skill point every three levels, and a character's level is the sum of his stat levels. Thus we have two skill points. We'll be putting these into strength and willpower. Finally, equipment. We have 200 gil to spend on weapons, armor, and items, bearing in mind what our primary job allows us to equip. We'll be spending this on a coral sword and a leather plate. I'd say the only part of character creation that might cause issues is the XP system and how it converts to levels. In addition, given how levels and ability specialties work, I could see the game developing the pre-planning issue that plagues the D20 system, albeit to a lesser degree. I will admit the traits and quirks having a narrative bent is a welcome addition, as is the secondary classes as mods for your main one, which is a good call. However, I keep coming back to that XP model. It's not bad, but it's clear it's meant for the long haul, and I'd hesitate to use this for one-shots. It could be that it's emulating the video games, where you're scraping by at first and near demigods by mid-late game, so... Mulligan? Owing to the video game's separation between combat and non-combat, 4th edition's mechanics are on similar pillars. Challenges and, well, combat. Challenges, the non-combat rules, are typically a straight D100 roll with the difficulty presented as chance of failure, i.e. difficulty 30 means a 30 or less is a failure. A character's skills represents how many times they may retry that roll in a challenge. And this is also where destiny points add a monkey wrench into things, acting as an extra effort pool that's shared amongst the party. When a character's quirk applies to a given challenge, they can spend a point to add 20 to their roll. In addition, traits can confer certain additional types of ways to spend destiny or to negate disadvantages. For example, the reputation trait allows one to spend destiny to influence others based on their reputation, but they would need to spend destiny to go undercover lest they be recognized. Combat uses the D100 approach as well, but with its own quirks, for lack of a better term. The first being how initiative works in a kind of horizontal and vertical way. Each participant rolls 3d10 and adds them together as normal. However, the faces on each die are important for the phase part of the initiative. Rounds operate on a phase system from 1 to 10, with participants being able to act when their die matches the phase number, discarding that die in the process. This comes into play because of how actions have two speeds, quick and slow. 
The latter determines how many phases they spend charging that particular action. For example, a character performing a slow 2 action on phase 3 won't activate it until phase 5. When it comes to roles in combat, this is typically formulated as stat versus stat plus a set difficulty. So a difficulty 40 earth versus fire roll would need to roll at least 40 plus the amount of points the target has in fire to pass. Critical hits in this regard activate on a successful roll of doubles, and typically this will deal double damage, but some abilities have their own effects with criticals. Now when it comes to calculating damage, this is typically based on the level of the stat used, multiplied by the weapon and adding the singles digit to the roll. There's a fair bit of crunch to combat due to these calculations, with the thing I see potentially causing the biggest issue being the initiative system. It's certainly going to be a culture shock, since most games use an, a single initiative count or a tick-based system instead of using both in this case, and in the latter they usually count downwards instead of upwards. Fortunately, there's optional rules sprinkled with throughout the text to make it a little bit easier, but there are still hurdles that'll need to be overcome. Fourth edition builds itself on a nostalgia concept with four pillars. Avoiding downtime, quick production, two games, and tabletop but not only. Of these, I'd say the one it really falters on is the two games approach, because it's more like one and a half. The combat section of it is as detailed as one might expect, but non-combat is a little light comparatively. The die roll and setup for challenges is nice, but there's still the inbuilt assumption that you'll be in for a fair amount of combat more than non-combat. While it's certainly in keeping with the video games, I can't help but wonder if there's a lost opportunity there. That aside, the system is nothing if not flexible, with a few ideas that might take some getting used to. There is, however, still the divide between mages and non-mages in terms of their pool of actions, and the way leveling works might result in some book jumping for some. That said, the best way for me to describe 4th edition is a vanguard. It's a middle ground between the pillars of several games we've covered, it makes for a decent starting point for expanding upon. With that in mind, I give 4th edition a stamp of strongly recommended. It's a nice balance of narrative and crunchy, with plenty of wiggle room to grow beyond that point. With that, Final Fantasy Week comes to a close. I won't be ranking the games I covered in terms of worst to best, as I feel each brings something different to the table. I merely wanted to demonstrate how time can change a single idea into a myriad of different results. As I said at the beginning, life imitating art, especially since the video games can go in so many different directions mechanically. And I'm sure there will be plenty more instances of going in different directions that I'll find as the years go by, but that is a story for another day.